Last item on the agenda here is a wrap up and returning to our own Ed Saltzman for that. Ed is currently a senior aerodynamicist with uh, Kentron's Planning Research uh, Corp uh, staff here at Dryden. He's had a no noteworthy career as an aerodynamicist for over 40 years with NACA and NASA. Although he retired from Dryden and NASA in 1981, he's continued to work here part-time for uh, one of our engineering support service contractors, as I previously mentioned. And his career has been spent in conducting aerodynamic research as it affects the performance of vehicles, uh, aircraft and ground vehicles. And some of you may know that in the early 70s, or the mid 70s and early 80s, he was involved in some work involving uh, trucks and uh, uh, vans in the era of the first energy crisis. So Ed Saltzman, wrap up please. Okay, uh, thank you. We're going to need that. Most of us here uh, are or have been associates of the Dryden Flight Research Facility, and I want to underline the word Dryden. And remember that one. And today we have honored and dedicated the supercritical wing research airplane, which is, <clears throat> in my mind, a significant transonic research facility. And I want to underline the, the word transonic. Transonic and Dryden, how do they relate? I'm going to try to establish a link. And uh, I, I believe we'll show that there is a link between Dryden and Transonic. First, next though, I'll uh, <coughs> uh, indicate uh, four items I want to cover. I want to recognize the man Dryden and the place Dryden, which is us, uh, relative to experimental transonic aerodynamics. I also want to recognize the inventor of the supercritical wing concept and how he dominated experimental transonic aerodynamics for at least three decades. I want to proclaim that transonic research is not just history and that transonic problems will surely still confront us. And then lastly, I want to recognize the people who worked on the supercritical uh, research airplane here. But now to back to uh, Dryden and uh, Transonic. And I gotta learn how to work this. Which button do I push to start the slides? Over on the left. Okay. Um, Dryden and Transonic. Uh, we wanna establish now what Transonic is. Uh, in ne early 1947, this is the way uh, transonic research was uh, considered. And as you can see, uh, there was quite a gap in theory. There were three experimental methods that were going through the transonic region. Transonic meaning the region above and below is being found here. But those three uh, experimental methods uh, were qualitative in nature. They're Instrumentation was marginal. Uh, two of them required tel telemetry, which hadn't been developed that well yet. And uh, there were, you were going to have to establish better theory, either on the basis of wind tunnel work or flight. And as you can see, the airplane hadn't gone supersonic yet, or uh, even the speed of sound. And uh, the wind tunnels were close to getting there. The uh, Slotted throat tunnel was being worked on. As a matter of fact, Dr. Whitcomb was working on it. But the plan was to establish a transonic research facility for flight as well as completing the slotted throat work in the tunnel. Later in 1947, the uh, aircraft designed for flight work in the transonic region flew Mach 1. In fact, it got to Mach 1 number 1.06. Uh, later, this airplane flew to nearly one and a half. 
A later pumped up version reached almost two and a half, but the thing we should remember is that this was basically a transonic research facility. And uh, that's my first link between uh, the place Dryden in this case and transonic research because the place Dryden is us. We are his namesake. The X1 in flying through the transonic drag rise provided a valuable uh, source of data or a wing pressure profile data at transonic speeds as well as stability and control and loads data. But I want to point out here, uh, that probably doesn't show very well, but here in flight data from the 8% wing and the 10% wing where we see drag coefficient plotted against Mach number and the, this transonic drag rise, which leveled off right about there and proceeded when it went faster, uh, is the uh, drag rise that I want to show uh, a little later in some very, very early work done by Dr. Dryden. And it is also the increment of drag that Dr. Whitcomb reduced with the area rule, which we'll also talk about in a little bit. Now I want to go way back in aerodynamic research history, back almost as far as uh, Dr. McCurr went earlier this morning, not quite that far back perhaps. In this case, uh, let's see, uh, let's pick out something like, uh, we'll say the invention of the steam engine would be uh, one end of the time scale we're talking about and the other end might be uh, as far back as Milt Thompson's birthday. At that time, a young PhD named Hugh Dryden and two co-workers obtained the first data from a ground facility that showed the beginnings of the transonic drag rise. Uh, here we have drag coefficient plotted against, in this case, they called it V over C. I wish that showed better for you that are back quite a ways. Take my word for it. This is V over C test velocity divided by the speed of sound plotted against drag coefficient for two airfoils of different thicknesses. And what they were doing at that time was evaluating air airfoil drag characteristics for propeller research. Airplanes at this time were flying about 100 miles an hour, most of them. The absolute speed record was below 280. Uh, to get these data, uh, they had to travel to Lynn, Massachusetts and borrow a compressor that was owned by General Electric Company. This compressor was a 5,000 horsepower compressor that they used to pressurize a large tank that was about 30 feet long and 30 inches in diameter. And at one end of this, they had an opening of 12 inches below which they placed their airfoil models. This, in other words, this was a free jet. It was very noisy. And incidentally, they had to use this borrowed uh, compressor system uh, just when General Electric let them use it. So they ended up doing their first tests on Christmas Day in 1923. Uh, after the tests, it is written here, uh, this is by Dryden himself, he says, we walked down the street in Lynn after the tests discussing the jet and notice that passers-by were staring at us strangely, and they were shaking their heads. It was some time before we discovered that they, we had been shouting at each other. At the top of our voices, we were both temporarily deaf as a result of working with our heads only a few inches from the large jet. Now, the primarily thing I wanted to show here was the beginnings of the drag rise. And this was done beginning Christmas Day, 1923. They showed the beginning of the drag rise for these various air, these two airfoils at various angles of attack. Incidentally, they didn't talk about Mach number. They talked about velocity ratio. And they didn't talk about transonic because there was no such word yet. They talked about a different flow regime. And once in a while they would say in their literature, uh, there seems to be a critical condition or a critical velocity. 
It was two years later, in 1926, I think that's when Milt was born, that Briggs and Dryden, his co-worker in the case I just showed you, and Dryden devised an experiment to obtain pressure data in a pressure distribution form, similar to what Dr. Whitcomb used and showed to us, on the same airfoil shapes that they had tested on Christmas Day in 1923. They wanted to go supersonic this time. So they devised the first convergent divergent test nozzle ever tested in the United States that actually provided quantitative, uh, or, or maybe Dr. Dryden would say qualitative, but I've seen the plots and it looks quantitative, uh, aerodynamic data. Uh, th this <laughs> was a two inch diameter nozzle uh, and it was a, another open jet. The cord of their airfoils was one inch. They tested uh, six airfoils that way. Uh, it was a, at this time, incidentally, as I indicated before, there was no such word as transonic. And Dryden uh, realized one was needed, so he invented the word, and it turned out to be transonic. However, uh, I'm going to walk away from the uh, mic here now so I can point it out a little better. As you can see, it, those of you that are close enough, it wasn't spelled the way we spell it today. It has two S's. There, here it's used again, here it's used again. These are excerpts from John Stack's Eighth Wright Brothers Lecture of December 1944. Uh, these two instances of transonic spelled with two S's is from the body of John Stack's lecture. And then this case here is where Dr. Dryden used transonic spelled that way uh, in his commentary on John Stack's lecture. Dr. Dryden was very logical. His reasoning was like this. Transcontinental, you take the word trans, you take the word continental, and you push them together. Transoceanic, why not transonic? Three years later, Dr. Dryden had left the Bureau of Standards, was, was in the process of leaving the Bureau of Standards, and he was on a train ride with Dr. Pro and Professor Theodore von Karman between Aberdeen, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. And they were talking about the need for a word to describe this region. Now, the uh, case that I just showed you was uh, uh, in 1944. This is three years later. And uh, Dryden said he had a word for it, transonic, spelled with two S's. Von Kormann liked the word, but he didn't like the spelling. And as you can see, that's the way Von Kormann wanted to spell it. In spite of Dryden's reasonable thinking, we all know which spelling has prevailed. Von Karman explains it this way. He says, Dryden was illogical and wanted two S's. I thought it wasn't always necessary to be logical in aeronautics, so I wrote it with one S. Very simple. In the course of their discussion or argument, uh, Dryden took a little convincing. So finally, Dr. Von Karman quoted the German poet Goethe or at least he paraphrased him and said, Goethe says some logic is desirable, but to always be logical is horrible. So I guess Goethe <laughs> had to contend with nerds back in those days. <laughs> so this gives us a glimpse of the connection between Dryden the Place and Transonic. We tested the first Transonic airplane here and the place is now named Dryden. We are the namesake. And of course, that was Walt Williams' test group called the New York Flight Test Unit. And we've also established a link between Dryden the man and transonic. He generated the first experimental airfoil data demonstrating the critical drag rise. He invented the word transonic. And he, with Briggs, designed the first converging diverging test no nozzle that provided real aerodynamic data in this country.
It's interesting to note that their data with this converging, diverging nozzle reached a peak Mach number of 1.08, the first X1 airplane flight that uh, exceeded the speed of sound went to 1.06, only a two hundredths of a Mach number difference between the two. Now, what about the man Whitcomb and transonic research? Well, he dominated transonic aerodynamic research for at least three de decades. Perhaps I should be corrected, and it can be established that it was significantly longer than that. He w first, uh, the part that I know of, he, he was an important part of the team that developed the slotted throat wind tunnel. He invented and conceived of the area rule. Here we see the uh, YF-102 on the left and the 102A on the right, which is the area ruled one. Uh, in this case, the wave drag increment was reduced about 25% by the area ruling process here. In addition, of course, he invented and conceived of the supercritical wing that we're talking about today. And uh, in this case, the drag rise Mach number of this configuration, not the wing now, but the configuration, was pushed up to about 0.97. And this, at this, this is at working lift coefficients. This is at the cruise lift coefficient. And as he indicated earlier, the drag rise Mach number of the wing itself was just nudging one. In addition, he invented and conceived of the winglets project, winglets concept. In this case, the fuel savings were about 6%. In uh, later versions, uh, where the wing loading was higher near the tips, uh, the savings would be greater. Now, what kind of agency or technical organization can spawn, if it indeed it did spawn? I didn't want that. How do I cancel it? Uh, spawn or nurture such an innovative research. I like to think it's an organization that can challenge conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom is all right if it's considered for what it really is. It's a reasonable starting place. But a habitual reliance on conventional wisdom leads you relatively close to the starting place. It increases the odds for the status quo. That's why it's encouraging for me to see one of the things that our new administrator said in a recent address, which I already showed you, <laughs> where he said, uh, in the new NASA, we'll welcome a diversity of views and ideas from both inside and outside the organization. And perhaps the words of uh, retiring deputy administrator James Thompson that he wrote in the winter issue of the NASA magazine were intended to challenge conventional wisdom when he wrote, I think sometimes NASA could use a little more internal controversy. Concern about conventional wisdom isn't limited only to the technical community. For example, here are the paraphrased words of a noted 20th century theologian. If you and I agree on every matter, one of us has ceased thinking. <laughs> and perhaps Dr. J.B. Harvey has said it as well as anyone. The mismanagement of agreement, not the inability to manage conflict, is the single most pressing issue of most modern organizations. I wonder. Is the spirit conveyed by these four individuals seemingly expressing concern about conventional wisdom representative of the environment that Dr. Whitcomb worked within during the years that he dominated the field of experimental transonic aer aerodynamics? Did his revolutionary ideas thrive because he worked in an environment that was unencumbered by conventional wisdom? Not quite.
As obvious as the need was for a revolutionary breakthrough in reducing the transonic wave drag, there were a few who said that the benefits from the area rule were largely fineness ratio effects. And there was conventional wisdom which claimed that the benefits from the reduced shock strength provided by the supercritical airfoil would likely be overshadowed, canceled out, by high trim drag. And some conventional, conventional wisdom adherents thought that the winglets were simply extra aspect ratio in disguise. They were wrong in every case. The original wind tunnel research work at Langley added to the confirmation flight data that was obtained out here at Dryden and the numerous, numerous commercial and military applications of these three technologies have discredited conventional wisdom. So the score is innovative radical transonic research. That's how I like to describe what he did. Three, conventional wisdom zero. <laughs> we should remember this score as we continue toward NASP and the external burning experiment and follow on supersonic and hypersonic vehicles after that. Hypersonic vehicles must still pass through the transonic toll gate. There's a toll extracted every time you pass through. And Dr. Wickham, is, his re research has shown that the cost at the gate can be lowered by innovative experimental work. And amazingly enough, even if there is not a red team or a blue team in support. <laughs> that would be an inside thing. <laughs> <laughs> we have a recent example, uh, by the way, uh, that uh, I think reflects the encroachment of conventional wisdom in the case of some of the airplanes that flew in the Gulf War. Some of the data I have looked at, and now this would be lift and drag data, of contemporary high performance aircraft used in the war show, reveal an erosion of aero design finesse, a slippage of aero design discipline. And by discipline, I mean you know, sticking to the principles compared to aircraft designed and built in the 50s and 60s. Uh, to be more specific, the wave drag is too high and parasite drag is too high compared to those earlier airplanes. This indicates to me that conventional wisdom does not go away or become old-fashioned. Every generation has its own form. In fact, it, it seems to me like it's almost like uh, chicken pox or measles or mumps that every generation has its cases of conventional wisdom. Just because each generation thinks it's more enlightened, it just doesn't work that way. Further, just because uh, this airplane that was dedicated today, one of the two, an important transonic research facility has been retired, maybe some of you will think of it as a museum piece. And I guess it is. And it also represents history, and transonic research has a history. Nevertheless, we should not think of transonic research uh, in historical terms. Transonic problems are still with us. The brilliant transonic innovations of the 50s and 60s did not revoke the laws of physics concerning transonic flow for future generations. It is my hope that the supercritical wing research airplane when I walk by it out there, and when other people walk by it, it is my hope that uh, it will be representative of the uh, innovative transonic work of the past. But in addition, it, it should remind us that if we limit transonic research to the past and only consider it history, the charges at the toll gate, the transonic toll gate, will be unnecessarily high for some future supersonic 
and hypersonic airplanes. Uh, this would be a good place, I think, to go back to Dr. Dryden and indicate what he said. Quote, the most important tool in aeronautical research, comma, even more than the large wind tunnel, comma, and then I'd like to add, this goes for airplanes too, is the human mind. The most important tool for aeronautical research is the human mind. Credit that to Dr. Dryden. This is uh, the end of my perspective on this, if you call it a wrap up. I want to now acknowledge uh, team members, uh, both at Langley and here in closing. It's appropriate to mention some of the team members who worked with Dr. Wickham, Tom Kelly, Perry Hansen, Dennis Bartlett, James Blackwell, he was introduced as Mickey today. That's what he goes by, I understand. Uh, Larry Lofton in an administrative capacity. Uh, and out here, uh, Dee Beeler in an administrative capacity. Ted Ayers, though he didn't work on the airplane that was dedicated today, was a team member on the supercritical wing crew back at Langley, uh, as you've already heard, working with uh, Dr. Whitcomb. Uh, he worked primarily on the... Uh, lower aspect ratio attack to application. And his transfer to Dryden significantly raised our transonic and supercritical experience and knowledge out here. As for the Dryden test research team, uh, I want to recognize them in this closing slide. And we already know uh, that we don't have all the names on there. Uh, Lou Steers, for example, should be on there, and he isn't. And I thought of another, and I don't believe uh, John Kerry is. Uh, what we're going to do uh, after Ken Soleil uh, finishes is put this back up again, along with a view graph which shows the digital fly by wire team members. And then we'll ask uh, people out in the audience that, that know that there are names missing to come up and write them on this uh, tablet, please. Uh, so we'll uh, blank this out now, and we'll try to show it after Ken is finished. Thank you very much. <laughs>